Thank you for listening to Nomad's Movie Reviews Podcast, available on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and Stitcher. Also, please follow Matt's Movie Reviews on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Reddit, Instagram, and MeWe. And of course, be sure to visit mattsmoviereviews.net for the latest reviews, top 10 lists, and more. Now, on to the show. The system is mostly infallible. I have no idea who put it into place or why. But it works. You live, you die. You live, you die. You live, you die. Sometimes there is a glitch. In your case, it was the girl. So why are you here? At the Lafayette. My name is Harrison Hardy. I'm moving in today. The Lafayette collects unusual people. What makes you unusual? It's a dream. A dream? I've had it about 5,000 times. It seems like a lot. Your condition is very rare. Condition? We should start the treatment. Maybe I can help you figure out what's in your dream attic. The dream changed. Just a tiny bit. You didn't find me sooner. Tell me, do you enjoy existing? There's some people you can't say no to. I did try to do it the easy way. You can close your eyes if you like. Hello and welcome to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast. I am your host, Matthew Perkovich, and this is episode number 428. Releasing April 15 in theatres across the US and on video on demand is Chariot, a sci-fi mystery that tells the story of an awkward young man suffering from a sleep disorder who undergoes an existential crisis when he moves into a new apartment complex. A surreal and surprisingly tender delve into themes of love, loneliness, in the fray will lie between life and death. Shari is also a latest film from writer and director Adam Segal, who I'm glad to say joins me now on the podcast. Adam, I thank you so very much for your time today. Thank you very much, and thank you for that intro to the film. You described it better than I ever have. I wish I'd sent that as the log line many times to uh, various people because that was great. Well, I thank you very much for that. It's such a cherry. It's such an interesting movie, and as I said in my introduction, it deals with some really kind of weighty kind of themes in there. I'm curious about the genesis of Chariot. What was it about? Um, what was going on with you and your life that really brought about this film? Because I'd imagine that a film that deals with themes like that I mentioned before would have, would have come from a, a certain place in your time in, in time in your life. Yeah, it did. I mean, it it came from a couple places. So from a from a personal perspective, you know, I lost my grandfather, and you know, was I just kind of had the thought as far as like you know, when you're that close with someone, like you got to be able to see them again, you know, like it just makes sense. Like, and that's, you know, become even more real to me. I lost actually my girlfriend about a month and a half ago, my partner. And so, oh, you know, very she, sorry helped about me, she helped me make this movie. She was on set with me the whole time. She was, you know, like integrally involved with this film, you know, as far as the overall sort of what my, what my was chariot was, You know, just to kind of try to like demystify the concept of death, not in Mm -hmm. a specific way of like, okay, this is what happens when you die, but more just to kind of open the idea that maybe we just haven't figured it out yet. Like, because there's tons of religions who will tell you what's going to happen when you die, and that's cool. And none of them can really show you any true hard evidence that that's the case. You know, nobody's come back to talk about it. So that's scary. And that's always this thing that people are going to be afraid of. And it's going to color all of the decisions in your life. Essentially, everything you do in some capacity is to avoid dying, you know, Mm. which is great. But maybe it's just something that we haven't figured out yet. You know, maybe there is another explanation for where you go or where your energy goes or what happens. That's not as scary. And I don't know if it's John Malkovich, you know, in a bad wig, you know, coming to get you. But 
maybe it's something. And so that in itself, like just sort of trying to portray that concept, it was what was my intention. What's really interesting about this film is the chemistry between Thomas Mann and Rosa Salazar. Um, yeah. You can feel it as soon as they see each other on screen. They both bring very different kind of vibes to their performances as well, which is just who they are as people and who they are as act- actors as well. What was it like in finding them two and putting them in, into the, the same room at the same time? Because I think it's just really kind of a electric in many ways, I think, on screen. Absolutely. And really, like you said, their characters in real life are very much who they are. And they were friends before we made the movie, so they knew each other. Mm -hmm. But Thomas is an extremely sweet guy and very, very kind, very calm, very, you know, mannerly and awesome. Rosa is a firecracker and Mm. she's very strong-willed and opinionated and passionate. And not that Thomas isn't, you know, he's very passionate. He's a very serious actor, but just his demeanor. He's much, he's much more like Harrison. He's very sweet and, sort of, you know, not shy, but, you know, a bit reserved in some ways. Rosa is not. And and so it was perfect. It kind of like plays into her. And that's what I wanted casting wise was for her to overwhelm him a little bit, but, you know, still to be that tenderness there so that we like her, you know, and I think she nailed it. You talked about John Malkovich in a bad week, and I've heard you talk about working with Malkovich and his the decisions he brings to his role, and kind of like what I love about John Malkovich, having talked to other filmmakers about him, is his willingness and his openness to, you know, not only work with directors, independent directors, and bring his kind of his name to projects, but his willingness to try different things as well. Um, and I think that's just such an important part of the whole acting process, right? Um, what's yeah. it also like for you to work with an actor like that to not only have his confidence in your screenplay, but also be yeah. willing to try things on set? Because, you know, I imagine mm-hmm. that any type of filmmaker can get some type of uh, stubborn resistance from someone of uh, his kind of magnitude yeah. and his credibility but where he is very much you know willing to go with the flow and i think that's an important aspect of, of the whole process of filming. you're absolutely right and had he shown up and been very belligerent and very sort of like you know oh you're a, you know a new i would have been like you're right cool you know you're john like you can he was the complete opposite just yeah. very professional cool passionate about the character talked a lot about the character you know just like a very small example was you just give an insight into who this guy really is is we were we were talking john and thomas and i were talking a day or two before filming and you know and thomas said do you think that harrison would have his own coffee cup like he doesn't sleep do you think he carries a coffee mug around with him sometimes to try to keep him up and i said yeah it's a great idea i like that and I said, let me talk to my prop guy and see if they can come up with a coffee cup. Malkovich texts me like an hour later and he's like, hey, Adam, I'm at a little pawn shop nearby. Look at all these cool coffee mugs. And he's sending me these like hilarious, like Garfield coffee mugs and stuff. And he's like, aren't these great for Harrison? Like, that's the thing, though. like very like in it, you know, like very much a team player. Everyone on set loved him. Super sweet, man. We've become really close friends after filming and can't speak highly enough of John Malkovich. I mean, the guy's a beast. The Matt's Movie Reviews podcast is brought to you by 80s Tees. 80s Tees is an online retailer of licensed t-shirts and pop culture gear from your favorite movies, TV shows, cartoons, video games, comic books, and musicians. Celebrate your inner 80s nerd and click on the link in the show notes below to get the raddest retro t-shirts delivered to your door. The Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast is brought to you by Loot Crate. Founded in 2012, Loot Crate is the worldwide leader in fan subscription boxes. Loot Crate partners with industry leaders in entertainment, gaming, sports, and pop culture to deliver monthly themed crates, produce interactive experiences in digital content, and film original video productions. No matter what you geek out about, Loot Crate has a subscription box for you. To get your very own exclusive collectibles, apparel, and gear delivered to your door, be sure to click on the link in the show notes below. What I love about these kind of sci-fi movies is really kind of small scale, but high concept sci-fi films. And I think it's something that you mentioned that you love as well, is the ambiguity that a lot of these films can have. 
there isn't yeah. any easy answers. And let's face it, in life, there isn't any easy answers, right? But I think exactly. things like this, it can bring about all different kinds of, you know, theories, all different types of, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, reactions like from, from, the, from, really? the, from the crowd. Do you like that? Do you like mm-hmm. the fact that when, when Chariot comes out, people are going to be making doing a guessing game in regards to yeah. a lot of things that's going on in your movie? Absolutely. I mean, my favorite filmmaker, you know, well, my favorite filmmaker is Kubrick, but outside of Kubrick, it's probably David Lynch. And I I respect so much that he just tries to convey his theme. That's all he cares about. He doesn't care what he's actually showing on screen. He doesn't care whether it's linear. You know, he's technically, obviously, a master, you know, in every capacity. And his films are so beautiful. But what's the most important to him is communicating the theme. And Mm -hmm. what and what the subtext of the film, you know, what he wants to convey, what he wants the audience to feel, take precedence over for him over even the narrative. And I feel the same. Like, I'm just not interested. Like, if I want to go see a linear sci fi, I'll go watch The Matrix. You know, I'll go watch a studio one that has bigger actors and better production value and be at VFX. You know, like, why wouldn't I? If I'm going to go watch an independent, I want it to be something that. I question and makes me think and like you said and makes me sort of wonder i wanted to just put a theory out there towards you after i watched chariot um and i don't i want to do it as sensitively as i can without doing any type of um spoilers um sure. the, and it, to me it has to do with the apartment complex which number one it's amazing that this film i found out this film was was done in Arkansas because I was sure that this was a downtown yeah. LA kind of thing because it does have that kind That's of. That's what I wanted. Yeah, and it, it's <laughs> just it's so great. Hey, guys, you yourself and your production designer really pulled that off. Um, the theory yeah. that I had was the apartment complex itself. To me, it kind of feels like a way station, or perhaps yeah. even that's a standard or kind of a like a theme upon a purgatory, um, yeah. or like people to they're there to move on to the other side. And the reason I, do, I say that is because there are things happening in our apartment complex that go beyond the, the realms of, 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 of well, like physical constraints that are placed upon our universe. Am I kind of like in the same in right wavelength in, in thinking that way? Absolutely, 100%. I mean, to be honest, I wrote Chariot, the first draft, while I was watching the TV show Lost mm-hmm. for the first time. And, and I, and I absolutely, I mean, that's the concept was just sort of this in between place, you know, there's a, um, there is a Fugazi song that I love the waiting room, you know, and that's what it's about. And it's about sort of the, you know, or even just like the, the Beetlejuice waiting room, you know, it's definitely an homage to those things. No question. Like that's, I love that idea of something that sort of sits between our reality and another one, you know, definitely. I also love in the movie the whole idea of masks Um, because not only do we see the mask that like, that that seemed kind of like the key, uh, that kind of like almost like a variation of kind of like a gas mask. There's a scene in the movie where Thomas is kind of all torn, almost like to like a siren song being sung on on the top of his apartment and the girl singing it has a mask on it kind of reminds me actually of that david lynch film um uh, mulholland drive with that um that oh, nightclub yeah. silencio where they go and they, yeah. they hear the song you know you don't know what she's singing about but you know it has some type of relevance just in the feeling of it as well what 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 are, what's the idea of masks to you in regards to your film does it have to do yeah. with perhaps just maybe ritual um does it have to do with anything of that kind of concept um because it's such an interesting kind of thing uh, in, in chariot a couple things. The first is that I like for for the Karn mask, the sort of a I, I mentioned like from Neil Gaiman's Sandman book. Mm-hmm. Um, I like that it you kind of use a mask to travel between realms, essentially. You know, like that. I liked that concept. You know, sort of like that's like your ticket that you hold on to to go between realms. But as far as Tori on the roof. I also like the mask. Like there's a, um, there's a line. So there was a song that really heavily inspired chariot. It's called uh, when I was done dying by mm-hmm. Dan Deacon. And I actually licensed it for the end credits for the film. And he says a line there where he, he's talking about after he dies. And he says that I went into space and the earth reached her hands up and pulled off my old face. 
you know and he's just kind of talking like you know cool like his old face came off and he puts on a new one in his next life and i love that like that and so that that's definitely a recurring theme as far as like throwing off your previous sort of you know face and putting on a new one um another thing that i really dug about the movie is in regards to kind of like almost kind of when Thomas first entered the industry apartment complex, he kind of is really kind of out of sorts and it really kind of comes down to being a stranger in a strange land, especially amongst, I think, in that apartment complex, kind of like artists as well. He's not really kind of like artistically kind of inclined in any sort of way, but he falls in love with the actress and he meets other people at a party that clearly are kind of like <laughs> avant-garde, et cetera. Does any of that come from your own personal experiences or maybe first time traveling out to maybe Los Angeles or any other kind of like art hub? Is that, is that a lot of that feeling? Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. I mean, I moved to LA when I was 19 and I remember, you know, this was in the, so this was in 2000 and, and two, Mm. you know, and I remember going to a party at Paris Hilton's house and just being (laughs) completely overwhelmed by the like, crazy people there and just like holy cow you know like this is like you know a new world it felt like you know just the stuff i'd seen in movies you know do you have recurring dreams recurring dreams are a big factor in this movie i think yeah. you like four thousand five hundred times <laughs> such a number i haven't had it i haven't had it that many times but I, my most frequent recurring dream strangely is one where i can fly but I'm always stuck in like a, like a gym, like a basketball gym and I'm flying mm. and trying to find a way out through the ceiling. And there's people throwing basketballs at me. It, you know, not as interesting as, as this one, but yeah, I've had that one a lot actually. You know, I've had a recurring dream about flying as well, but my one is I'm always getting off the ground and I kind of float, but then I just kind of get pulled back down again, um, which is kind of reminiscent, I guess, of that movie Aim the half. Remember the opening scene of that movie? Uh, where yeah, he's flying yeah, and yeah. someone gets a hook or something and brings him down. That's my kind of dream. I love that yeah. film too. I mean, I, oh, I, I, love, I just love films kind of like what your film does with Chariot, which kind of like brings about, it makes people think and it makes people feel. And I think that's kind of like a rare kind of uh, thing for both of them. And for everyone out there listening right now, Chariot available in theatres across the US at April 15, also available video on demand. I really recommend people check out this film if you want to watch a, a sci-fi mystery that has, like I said, has feeling, it has thought, it has heart. And, and I re- really think it's a film that will make you think afterwards when the credits roll. And I think that's really important these days with movies because, you know, we don't really see that anymore in regards to uh, the big blockbuster movies. We've got to look to independent films and independent filmmakers like yourself, Adam. So congratulations for the movie. Best of luck with your upcoming you. film. You're over in London now filming there. And um, I can't wait to Appreciate talk to you again when that movie comes out. Absolutely. Let's do it. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching the Matt's Movie Reviews channel. Please subscribe for more reviews podcast interviews, and exclusive content. Also, if you would like to request a review and support my work, please join my Patreon via the link in the description below.